seats. Hate to break up the conviviality, but we will do that in, with the desire of getting started and getting on our way with our exciting speakers this morning. Welcome to the Cottingham Colloquium, our annual professional development event for psychological counseling services. It's fantastic to see all of you here today. My name is Deb Osborne. I'm an associate professor within the program of psychological counseling services. And I have some thank yous to get underway first. So first of all, let me know there's two folks standing out there. They're probably the most important people here. David Murphy, who has been, uh, he's our graduate assistant working with the Cottingham Colloquium and has made this run effortlessly. So could we give him a hand, please? He's not, he sees us. And Ashley Minton as well. She's right out front. She's the one that took our sign in yesterday and today. So could we give her a hand? Every year, this event gets better and better because of the graduate assistant and because of Ashley. We've got these beautiful posters this year and it just improves year after year. So we will continue to see what will happen next year. I don't know if she keeps surprising me with her great ideas. I wanted to also thank uh, Dr. Peter Scanlon, who is right up front, and Dr. Bob Reardon for their vision for this colloquium. So if we could say thank you to them. <laughs> and finally, thank you to our speakers who have come from various distances to come and share their expertise, their experiences, give advice um, on the topic of entrepreneurship. So thank you to our speakers. <laughs> A wonderful kickoff from our new dean the college of in the College of Education, Dr. Damon Andrew, who it's fantastic actually to have him come and speak because he himself is an alumni from the College of Education within sports management. He's also got the distinguished record of being a distinguished alumni from, where was it, uh, University of Southern Alabama, UF, and then FSU. So with all that, I welcome him to the stage. <laughs> Thank you so much, Deb, and I want to welcome everyone to the 8th Annual Cottingham Colloquium, which of course is held in honor of Dr. Harold F. Cottingham, who actually established our counseling program 60 years ago in what was then called the Department of Guidance and Counseling here in the College of Education. So uh, many of you have probably heard this, but there's an old saying that goes, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seed you plant. And the seeds that Dr. Cottingham planted 60 years ago have culminated at a legacy at Florida State University that is simply unmatched. So today, our programs educate counseling psychologists, school psychologists, mental health counselors, and career counselors. I know we have many uh, faculty and students in the, in the room today, and you know that you go to a university, if you hope that university leaves a mark on you, I hope you think about the mark that you plan to leave at, at this university, uh, just as Dr. Cottingham did. Now, Dr. Cottingham, or Dr. C, as he was affectionately known, remarkably directed 115 dissertations throughout his distinguished career, which of course exponentially impacted the counseling and human systems field. So we're also very, very, very grateful today that Dr. Cottingham's daughters, Rebecca and Sarah, have been able to join us this year. Thank you, Rebecca and Sarah. Dr. Peter Scanlon, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, who has taken a leadership role in providing the financial support that makes this colloquium possible. So the topic for this year's colloquium is new entrepreneurs in psychology, and we're so fortunate to have a number of leaders in the field in this area um, who also happen to be alumni of FSU's College of Education. So we're really excited to hear about what their knowledge and experiences and share those with us. So today, let's honor Dr. Cottingham the best way that we can by planting more seeds of knowledge. And thank you for honoring Dr. C with your presence today. I hope you will all enjoy the rest of the colloquium. And now I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Peter Scanlon, our primary benefactor for the event. Dr. Scanlon.
Well, <clears throat> this is the 60th anniversary of the department. <coughs> Pretty amazing. Uh, and I wanted to take a minute to just kind of give you a little historic perspective of the department. And it started in, if you can believe this, 1823. The territorial legislature uh, began planning and establishing systems of higher education in anticipation that the territory would be accepted as a state. Now remember, in 1823, Florida was not a state. Uh, in 1845, Florida was admitted to the, as a state to the Union. And uh, Congress uh, told the state that they needed to establish two institutions for higher education, one east and one west of the Swanee River. We won't mention what happened east of the Swanee River because they just went the wrong direction, but uh, here in the west, this is us. Uh, by 1851, the state legislation approved the establishment of two institutions for higher education. And the mission of these institutions, as it dictated by the legislature, was, quote, uh, the instructions of persons, both male and female, in the art of teaching all the various branches that pertain to good common school education. And next, to give instruction in the mechanics, arts, in husbandry, in agriculture, chemistry, and in the fundamental laws and in what regards the rights and duties of citizens. Seems easy, right? So, in response to this, the city of Tallahassee became rather entrepreneurial. And they started uh, a school for boys called the Florida Institute. And they, their hope was that, that when the state got around to funding the university, they would use this, uh, the Florida Institute, uh, as the start of the university and would basically take it over. So they offered the Florida Institute to the legislature, and the legislature said, nah, no thanks, we don't really want it now. Uh, in 1851, the state legislature finally did approve the two institutes did approve that they would fund two institutions for higher education. Uh, and, and, very important gentleman, uh, the mayor of Tallahassee was Francis Epps. He was the grandson of Thomas Jefferson. And he offered again the institute to the state, and at this point the state <laughs> accepted it. And they accepted it because, here's their reasons for accepting it, railway connections, a salubrious climate, and it's intellect, intellectual, refined, and moral community. I'm not sure they had really spent much time here. Anyway, uh, and this became the seminary in Tallahassee. In 1857, the state seminary west of the Suwannee River began offering post-secondary instruction to male students. Francis Epps, the former mayor, became the first president and he instilled his Jeffersonian ideas of liberal education and citizens that were, uh, were trained and educated. There were only white guys, but uh, at least they were trained and educated. The school became co-educational in 1858, when it incorporated the Tallahassee Female Academy, which had been around uh, for 15 years. And this became the West Florida Seminary, which was located on the hill where Westcott Building now stands. It's the oldest institution of higher education in Florida, the oldest. None of those others can claim it. Uh, following the Civil War, the um, uh, institution grew rapidly, and in 1891, seven bachelor's degrees were awarded. Uh, in 1897, the institution was involved in the first liberal, was evolved to the first liberal arts college in the state. And in 1901, it became Florida State College. It had four departments, but uh, one department was called the college, the other was School for Teachers, and the School of Music, and the College Academy. In 1903, first master's degrees were offered. 252 students were enrolled as undergraduates. 
and uh, the degrees in classics, liter literary, and scientific studies were established. It was the first, uh, and it had the first university library, 1903. They got a lot of library for a little bit. <coughs> Uh, in 1905, the legislature reorganized their six institutions for post-secondary education into two institutions. Uh, the Florida State College in Tallahassee became the Florida Female College. And in Gainesville, the University of Florida was a designated men's school. Uh, when this happened, the male students moved to Gainesville and took with them the football team. Uh, which had been, and the Florida State College football team had been champions in 1902, 03, and 05, and they went to Gainesville. Uh, uh, in uh, 1905, they changed the name to Florida Female College, from Florida Female College to the Florida State College for Women. But, but and by the 1930s, this became the third largest uh, women's college in the country. <clears throat> in uh, 1947, the school became co-educational. 1947, of course, was the end of the first, Second World War, and a lot of servicemen were coming back, and they had GI benefits, and they could go to school, and believed in hopeful uh, use of education, and they joined the school, became co-educational, and the student body grew to over 4,000 students. And they opened the uh, Seminole and needed uh, an athletic symbol, and they chose the Seminole. The Flying High Circus was established so that women and men could participate in joint sporting activities. And they also started a football team. I guess that's the first thing you need. To add the library first. Uh, and 18, in 1949, the university underwent a major reorganization and expansion. The university in, in 48 had four schools, arts and science, education, home economics, and music. And the plan was to add a new school of library science, social welfare, which later became social work and criminology. Um, business school, journalism, which was discontinued in 59, and nursing. The faculty who took on this expansion have come to be called the 49ers. This is the worst picture that I can read. I don't know how I messed this up, but anyway, you can sort of, it's, it doesn't look like an impressionistic picture. This is an impressionistic picture of the Carol Cloudingham. Uh, in 49, one of the young, uh, and it was a young fellow who had a new doctor from Indiana, and he was, uh, had teaching experience in public schools. Uh, he, during the Second World War, he was uh, served as an instructor for the Navy. And in WW2, he, he taught the college, uh, college level courses and was a director of guidance and research for public school system. So Dr. Cotting had a lot of experience in guidance and in instruction, in high school instruction and college instruction. Uh, and in 1948, he came to Florida State as an associate professor in the psychology department. And he was assigned the task of developing a graduate curriculum in guidance training. He was also tasked with the responsibility of coordinating a committee uh, based in the psychology department to develop professional training for guidance and counseling. The first degrees, uh, a doctoral degree, was awarded in 1953. And there were two graduates that year. Uh, five more doctoral degrees were awarded before the program became its own department. The program existed as a special program uh, in applied psychology until 1953, when Dr. Cottingham was transferred to the School of Education. Uh, within the School of Education, the curriculum was redesigned in order to better prepare guidance professionals for schools, you know, public schools and colleges. By the 1950s, there were demands in the university in two areas. One was public schools re required uh, specific training for guidance and uh, guidance counselors. At that point, they, um, this is Dr. Cunningham. Sort of famous for being president. <laughs> and he got his picture taken.
take them there. <laughs> uh, and they, uh, Dr. Cunningham worked uh, to develop uh, criteria for guidance counselors and establish certification requirements, and they needed to be able to educate uh, guidance counselors so that they could attain certification. Uh, so that was one major need. And the second need was a growing need for professional psychologists, both in public and private sector. In uh, 1958, Dr. Cottingham founded the department, it was the Department of Guidance and Counseling in the College of Education. It was no longer a special area in the department, uh, was, and this was really the, the start of our department 60 years ago. Uh, and it was an important recognition of the role of guidance and counseling played in education. The department had gone through a number of name changes since then. I found some of them. I'm sure I've missed some. And <coughs> might it, has it changed today? I don't think so. Um, but these are some of the names. Um, I think I was in here somewhere. It's changed four times since then. Uh, that's probably because committees decide these things. So it could change periodically. It's done in the Department of Counseling, Psychology, and School Psychology. Five years after its founding, the department was the second largest department in the College of Education in just five years. Uh, looking back on the last 60 years, there's been a lot for us to be proud of. And we're all grateful for the opportunities that we have had in studying here in the department. Uh, we need to be especially appreciative to those many students and professors who helped shape the department. And none has been more important than Dr. Harold Cottingham. Dr. Cottingham did more than establish the department, he put his stamp on it. Dr. Bob Reagan, who will speak after me, uh, said, and this is a quote, of the 49ers, those young faculty professor, faculty who shaped the development of our current graduate research university out of the Florida State College for Women, Harold's bold leadership laid the foundation for the academic unit that remains vibrant and strong today. And no true words have been spoken. This is the second worst picture. Uh, another. Sarah, this sort of looks like a Sarah, anyway. This is uh, Dr. Cottingham with Vice President um, Humphrey, and they were signing legislation. Uh, Dr. C, it's easy, when you were with Dr. C, and there's not many people in this room who really knew him personally, some certainly, but when you were with Dr. C, you forgot about all his lofty accomplishments. Uh, he was outstanding list of outstanding uh, professional accomplishments. Uh, he was the department head for 10 years. Uh, he held a number of state and national professional associations, including the president of the American Personal and Guidance Association, which is now the American Guidance Council, they changed their name too. Um, he served at, in the Department of Labor, uh, National Manpower Advisory Committee, and consulted for the U.S. Training and Employment Services of the Department of Labor. Met with President Johnson, Vice President Humphrey, testified before Senate committees, I believe eight times. Uh, some were chaired by Senator Robert Kennedy. He published 50 professional journals and articles and books. He directed over 100, 115 doctoral dissertations. I recently saw a list of the doctoral dissertations and noticed mine was on the list. So it, I would say at least 116. Um, try not to take that personally. Um, so he, he had an incredible amount of laurels and accomplishments, yet when you were with him, that, that wasn't important. It wasn't important to him. And you're with him for a little while, it wasn't important to you either because he, you knew he was about something else. Uh, when you sat down with him, he wanted to know about what your thoughts were. He would share his thoughts, but he wanted to know what your thoughts were. In class, he had a way of getting everyone involved. He, shared, he would share your ideas and putting things together for ourselves. Uh, you knew that he valued your input. His influence is apparent in the department today. 
He modeled the behaviors he was trying to teach. He modeled openness, uh, academic knowledge, and a willingness to grow personally. Personal growth was very important, not just for him, but for really for the whole department. Um, you knew that education couldn't be just the acquisition of knowledge, and the development of skills. He knew that you had to grow as people. He held us responsible for that, and he modeled it. He modeled it every day. He knew that if you wanted to teach empathy, you had to be empathic, not just to your clients and students, but to everyone. But life is a fabric, and you can't do parts of it some way and other parts of it other ways. His life was consistent, and he had that integrity. Dr. C didn't just teach about concern or empathy, he modeled it. And he became the definition of authenticity. We're all fortunate to have his, his direction and image with us. That's him. I wish you had a chance to, to meet him, but if you haven't, talk to people who have not. I'm going to now introduce Bob Reardon, who I don't think anybody has ever heard of here. Um, but um, I'll get rid of this.
It was important to me to try to understand this more because that slide that Peter had with all the different department names and so forth, Every time we got switched into another configuration, it meant that we were, we now had new neighbors and new colleagues. And one of the things I began to notice in experiencing this was that many of those other programs had a really strong sense of their history. And they were really, really proud of that. And they talked about it a lot. And the counseling program didn't really seem to have that. And so, I thought, well, uh, let me see what I can find about our find out about our culture and our identity. And so, just like Peter said, I did a little checking, found out that Harold was one of the 49ers. I said, well, golly, that means our founder came here at the time when the graduate programs in physics, chemistry, and history, and all of the other important uh, units at FSU were being created. So, hey, we we have a place. We belong here along with other uh, important programs at the university. Our founder helped to assure that. So uh, what to do about it? Uh, so uh, to try to get a handle on this, I drafted a proposal. And I was hoping that we'd find somebody in the foundation and uh, um, get some money and try to uh, do something to help us establish ourselves a little bit more. And so that proposal said, well, let's see if we can have a colloquium to honor uh, Dr. Cottingham. That uh, proposal was revised several times. Jim Sampson was involved in that in France for about two. And eventually, the program faculty uh, endorsed it and said, yes, this is something that we want to do. So well, now what? So I wrote another little proposal. It, the writing part. I wrote another little proposal in 2006 to the DeGraff Fund. That fund is still around. And two students were hired to research the history of the Department of Guidance and Counseling. And one of the things they did was identify 450 doctoral graduates. I thought, holy cow, 450. That's just a huge number. I remember this was in 2006. As a result of this work, I learned about some really, really distinguished alumni of our program. And one of those that I happened upon was Peter Scanlon. And the thing that I found was a video of Peter being interviewed by the sportscasters Pat Summerall. Uh, you've got to be a certain age to know who Pat Summerall was, but he was the big deal in terms of sports announcing and all that out. Uh, my goodness, if Peter got Pat Summerall to talk to him about this program that he created in Boston, that's, that's, a, that's big. And what they were talking about was South Bay Mental Health in Boston, a not-for-profit organization that employed over a thousand people and had a $30 million budget. So put that together. So Peter ended up getting an award uh, from the College of Education, uh, a Distinguished Alumni Award. And so he came back for the ceremony. We're sitting and we're sort of reminiscing and talking about things. And he said, uh, hmm, has anybody ever done anything uh, to remember Harold? And I said, oh, well, we have a proposal, but we, we're having a little problem with funding, and so the proposal's just been sitting there. And he said, well, how much do you need? And I said, well, we need $25,000 to get it going. And he said, I can do that. Four words. That's why we're here today. A year later, the first colloquium was held, and Peter said, I can do that. I might add uh, that Peter and his wife Lois, uh, through their Vandermark Foundation, have added funding for this colloquium more than 20 times over the initial amount. And they've also funded a tour <coughs> that developed at FSU on successful co-parenting after divorce, which has been translated into 
other languages and is used in other countries. The foundation is also involved in projects in India, Hanoi, and the Dominican Republic. The graduates of this program are an absolutely remarkable and distinguished group, and some of them are in this room today. So if you're a current student, don't be shy. Talk to them about who they are and what they've done. So in closing, one of the goals of this colloquium is to help current students learn about diverse options for their professional work. And that's what we're going to do today with the help of our panel. Uh, we're going to learn about the new, new and different kinds of things you can do with your professional degree in counseling. And uh, the Katzes, Nolan, and she are going to start us off uh, and share their story about what they've been doing. So, thank you. Um, 
a lot of what I do for the practice has to do with helping the staff run an efficient practice, um, maintaining the communication between the staff, um, being on top of how the billing with insurance runs. Uh, so that's, you see all those things happening with all the codes. Um, and then consulting with the doctors, I like maintaining all the all the rules, so up to date on legal side of things uh, for different types of individuals, what's governing uh, our licenses, what's governed, what are the ethical considerations on different things, and everybody who publishes all the ethics on different types of cases, um, so I can provide that type of consultation for them. Um, and then the big piece for me is always running things efficiently, so making sure that the least amount of work is done for the best product. Um, that I find really fun. <laughs> so, uh, I am social, investigative, and enterprising is my calling code, and I am actually pretty well differentiated. The things I don't like to do, I don't do. Uh, in, our, <laughs> in our practice, uh, you know, she was definitely more of the organizational type, and I am more of the marketing, sales, sort of face of the business. Uh, in it, and, and it works out really well because a lot of people are asking, oh my god, you work with your wife, how does that go? <laughs> I'm actually, we're lucky in that we're good at different things and we really don't step on each other's toes uh, very much. Um, you know, for me, socially, I've always loved helping people. It's really important for me. Uh, I, it just makes me happy when I see people doing better, uh, investigative. I love solving problems. Uh, it's to me, differential diagnosis is one of my favorite work activities. Uh, doing assessments, I know part of my reputation in the community is that I go above and beyond. So, you know, talking to not only parents and the kid, but also going forward and talking to teachers, talking to, you know, if they're going to a church, talking to a pastor, talking to all different people in their lives. So I'm getting a really good sense of what this person is like in a variety of settings, because we know that can be quite different. Uh, and then enterprising, which I think at this point, if I redid the self-directed search, I'd probably come out SEI just because of how much I really love doing the enterprising side of the business. Is doing a lot of sales and marketing and, and things like that. And sales, as you guys will, will realize more and more through your practica and internships and residencies, uh, is that you have to sell psychology to your clients. You know, they're not, a lot of times a teenage you know, 14-year-old boy who's getting a lot of behavioral trouble is not coming into your office like, I really want to be here. You know, it's, they don't want to be there. So you have to find how to sell, you know, psychology to them. And that's often a huge challenge and, and at this point where I think my code plays into me. Um, so based on our uh, career profiles, we felt like private practice was right for us. And uh, it's not all roses, okay? Private practice is not necessarily easy. There are a lot of pitfalls, so we, you know, designed our presentation to help you understand some of those as well. So we're going to start with that. Um, so first thing to keep in mind is that it is a business, okay? You may, we all probably have an S somewhere in our Holland Code, and most likely it's the first letter. So you're going to want to help people. You're going to hear a lot of sob stories. You're going to hear a lot of different life circumstances that are, you know, you're going to feel like you want to help. But in reality, you own a business, and you have to pay not only yourself but your employees. So I like to use Medicaid as an example of this. Medicaid pays about thirty-five dollars per hour in our area. Okay, our hourly rate is one hundred and eighty dollars per hour. The average decent insurance rate is between $100 to $120 per hour. So you can do the math, you can see about five to six Medicaid patients or clients in the same, you know, for the same amount of money that you can see one of those others. So you do have to keep that in mind as you go forward. Okay? Uh, another thing is you're not paid for your indirect hours. So you can do a lot of above and beyond things, but just keep in mind that you're not going to be things you have to sort of keep track of that sort of thing um, in terms of favoritism you have to be very careful about that sort of thing okay if you waive a fee or alter a fee or do something special for one client you have to do the same for all your clients because if you know if you change uh, if you waive a certain fee and insurance finds out about that 
And that can actually be considered fraud. If you may remove any things like that. Or if someone just happens to find out, oh, you've reduced their rate to $100 per hour, and someone else finds out about that, then in the community, people are going to think that they can negotiate with you. And if you don't do that, well, then they're going to say, why me? So you have to be careful about those sort of things. You have to balance uh, ethical guidelines in how you practice. Okay, so. In many other types of business, businesses, when they give you a referral, like if you look for a plumber in Fort Myers, then you're going to come up with, I forget what the name of that website is, but when they give you referrals, and those referrals pay a fee to that referral source. In psychology, we can't do that. So if you're getting tons of referrals from a psychiatrist or a school or something like that, you can't give them anything back. You have to be careful about that sort of thing, even though you want to sort of reward them for providing you business. Um, also, in terms of advertising, okay, I always think in, in general advertising for psychology is just kind of awkward, right? In a magazine, it's like, come see us if you're having problems, you know, it, just it, it, it never quite feels right anyway, but you can't say that you do things better than another practice. So most of what we have seen actually shows that direct advertising for a psychological group is mostly worthless because you have to be so vanilla about how you would present anything and it's really expensive to present uh, in different print and TV and things like that. So, uh, and the last thing is that you may have somebody that is really successful through your care and you might want them to sort of share with the community that they had a good experience with you or now we know the internet, you know, when getting, uh, you know, comments and reviews on your practice and you can't do that. You can't ask them to do so Other things you just have to be careful about as you're going through. Okay. Uh, one thing here, you can see a little far side, we're big far side fans. Um, and I wanted to just hit on one point, and then we'll let Shiva go, uh, is that when the first career class I took was with Dr. Samson. And he came out, and Dr. Samson, I do not remember the name of the song, but I remember it was about a fisherman. Uh, and the whole song was about that you have to evolve as a professional, or else you are going to eventually go out of business. Look at Blockbuster. Okay? So, as we understand more and more about the practice of professional psychology, we have to evolve, or else we will eventually. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give you guys more headaches. This is this is a fun part, stressful <laughs> part of going into practice. Um, Evolve and Inspire kind of looks at it's really important for us to keep up with technology. So um, unfortunately, people in our field don't tend to be tech savvy people, uh, and so you do need to be paying attention to how your website works, um, how's your emails functioning, if it's HIPAA compliant, are you maintaining electronic records, are you compliant with different electronic record standards to be claiming that, um, are you going to get involved in telehealth, if you're doing telehealth, are you billing it correctly. Um, this is all the things that you have to continually consider, um, otherwise you can expire in your business. Okay, so liabilities. Um, there's a few things that we talk about with liabilities, and that has to do with, these are things that will come back and haunt you if you ignore them. Um, so one thing is don't burn bridges. You may not like another practitioner in the area that you work in. Um, you may feel like some of their work is questionably ethical. <laughs> uh, but it's not your responsibility to badmouth them in the community. Most of the time, the people who work in mental health all know each other. And so somebody else might have a better um, feeling about that person. You say something negative, that's going to reflect back poorly on you, not on them. Uh, okay. Review cases that you accept closely. What this means is that when cases come in, they might come in initially just say, I'm this type of case, and that matches with your specialization. So you're like, oh, ADHD, I do that, that sounds great. Um, and that comes in, and you start seeing them, and all of a sudden, all these other things start trickling out, different family dynamics, different um, concerns about maybe there's domestic violence in the home, or those types of things that you just don't have specializations in. They, it is okay to refer out. 
Um, it's okay to refer out at any point in the process. It's okay to refer out after an intake. It's okay to refer out after working with somebody for a year. There comes a time sometimes that you're not the appropriate fit for them, and it's really important that you know when you're not. Um, that's where case consultation is really important to maintain those boundaries and make sure that you're always taking and continuing with cases that are an appropriate fit for you. Um, big headache for private practices are HIPAA. Um, so there's lots of information out there about what HIPAA looks like. There's hundreds of pages of documents that have been put out by the federal government. Um, you probably want to read those. Uh, you probably want to have a HIPAA manual for your practice and be adhering to it. Um, if you don't have a HIPAA manual, that's a problem. If you don't have a form, and you don't have those things all created consistent with whatever has currently been published on that, that's a problem. Um, so you have to read those things. You have to be up to date with them. You need to be receiving trainings on them. Uh, they're really boring. <laughs> and they're super technical. <laughs> Uh, okay, being careful with confidentiality, so considering if you have a website that somebody can fill in a bunch of uh, personal health information, then is that website that it's running through, do you have, is that HIPAA compliant all the way through? Do you have business um, contracts with them for them to be HIPAA compliant as well? Um, does your, so that just keeps running through. Does your collection agency have all your reception been trained on that? So you should have a manual and everybody should be trained on it. And that should be being updated and revised on a regular basis. Okay, yes, that's important. Uh, if you get hacked and lots of people's information have been released, uh, if people don't know this, you do have to post your name federally and self-report of my shame on me, and that stays as a public record. So that's where you really don't want to end up in a sticky situation that way. Uh, record keeping. Um, so if you've been reading ethics, then you know you got about seven years to keep everybody's records. Um, there's debates on whether or not it should be kept longer for forensic cases or uh, ones that have been involved in the courts. And that's from last point of contact. Um, and so that gets sticky about how people monitor that. So if somebody decides to send you an update email a year later, you're like, I'm not, I gotta keep your record another year. <laughs> um, so you have to print that and keep it. Uh, so really paying close attention to that record keeping. If you've had multiple family members participate in therapy, uh, there becomes a question of whose record is it? And if I participated, uh, was it not my therapy too? So how many releases do you need to get before you release a record? Uh, there's lots of little sticky situations like this. If you have parents that are divorced and one wants you to release the record and the other doesn't, there's more things to figure out. So there's a lot of different liabilities and if you annoy somebody, they can come after you. And whether it's valid or invalid, it creates a headache and something that you have to clean up. Okay, so if you must build, a, build from scratch, if you're like, no, I love headaches, let's do this. <laughs> 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 this is what happens next. Okay, so models for practice, and you'll hear some other people speak today. Some people are solo practitioners, meaning that they're the only one in their practice. Um, some people are group practitioner, meaning that there's several people in their practice. You can have a multidiscipline, meaning that people of different degrees and different backgrounds. There's some people that partner with. Um, other types of specializations like occupational therapy, speech therapy, tutoring services. So are you going to be just um, therapists in your practice or are you going to have other types of professionals? Um, and then within that, there's two different types of models for, for group practices. There's an employee model and there's 1099 model. So an employee model is when you hire everybody and they're working for your business. They're considered your employee. Employees, the employer pays more money on them. That's what it pretty much boils down to. Uh, they're going to pay some of the taxes and fees for that person, whereas the 1099, they're going to get hit with those fees themselves. If we think about it, um, a 1099 is some is the same as if I bring somebody in to redo my floors. I have a 1099 relationship with them when it reaches a certain amount. Cost. Mm -hmm. And so when they redo my floors, I don't get to 
tell them when to come. I don't get to, you need to be here at this hour. They're gonna tell me when they're available. That's why they do those weird windows. I'm like, I'll show up anywhere between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m., whatever. <laughs> so that's their job to run their own business. I don't get to tell them I don't like their employee. I don't get to tell them that I think some of their work product doesn't quite work for me. You either have, you know, you either hired them to do that portion of the work or you didn't. That's that's the only type of relationship that 1090 mice have. Whereas employees, I can evaluate my employees. I can tell them that product was not quite up to par. Um, we want you working on this. I want to see you getting continuing education in this area. Let's talk about consultation. Let's get you some additional supervision if you want to expand into this specialization. As an employer, I have more control over the work product that I'm producing from everybody in my office. Uh, in turn, another big thing to consider is um, non-compete. So it's not unusual for a group practice to have a non-compete clause. What that means is for the duration of you working there, you can't then go set up another practice somewhere else and compete with them directly. That also sometimes comes to so different practices, sometimes have a tail. What a tail means is that after you leave, they might say, now you can't practice for this long in this radius around me. Um, that's pretty standard in most private practices. Um, when we talked about it, we have a non-compete for the duration of the contract length. We've never done a tail. That felt weird to us. You don't work for me. You don't work for me. <laughs> that's OK. I'm all right with it. Uh, but non and, and both can have non-solicitation. Non-solicitation means that you can't solicit the clients from the practice that you're working at to go somewhere else, to go like, hey, you want to see me off hours when we're here? Uh, that's inappropriate, and so you'll, you'll see those types of things in a lot of the group practice uh, contracts. Uh, but they can look different, so it's really important that you read those carefully and know what they entail and what the person is referring to regarding that. More than anything, what's that protecting as a business? Because at first we didn't want to do non-competes. We want people to work for us because of us. And in reality, you do have to protect yourself because what it's protecting you against is someone who works for you for a year, gets a caseload of clients, and then says, all right, see ya, thanks, that was fun. And all that work that you put in to get them full, they take advantage of, and it takes anywhere from two to three years to really make an employee a very profitable thing for your business. So that's really what it's protecting. Okay, professional and business identity. Uh, just a few things that I just want you to know that you'll need to do pretty soon after you start a business. Uh, one is get a national provider identity number or an NPI number. Uh, you may not know this coming out of graduate school, but you need that, especially if you're going to do anything in the world of insurance. Okay? National Registry is a national organization of professional psychologists. Uh, it gets you a certain amount of uh, recognition. People can look you up, things like that. A uh, business tax identification number. Uh, this is where it's no longer your social security number, that you actually have a business that their number functions as the same thing as a social security number in a way. Uh, and then there's different options for how you would incorporate, which does provide a lot of benefits depending on which type of corporation that you create. Uh, you can consult with a financial professional for that. You can consult with a lawyer for that sort of thing to determine exactly which type of corporation would be best for your particular business. And then uh, usually local resources. So uh, where we live in Fort Myers, there's Florida Gulf Coast University. And they actually have a pretty famous uh, small business development center there where I went when I first started the practice and they just told me all these different things that I had no idea. Like you need uh, you know, to have different certificates just to have you know, a business, different tax related things that I know, didn't know about. They gave us lots of free resources on how to build a website for free, things like that. Uh, that was just really, really helpful. Even just going to some of the other practices in town, if they're willing to talk to you, you can talk about some just basic startup things uh, with them. Okay, and then uh, things about location. Okay, so one of the big considerations here is rent versus buy. So you can rent an office space from another organization. 
uh, and it's going to be lower cost most likely. However, if you buy your building or buy your office, then there's a lot of tax advantages to that. Okay, so you'll need to know in your particular case which one is better, but there are options either way, and there are certainly benefits either way to how you do it. Um, having a centralized location is very important. So we, our particular building is just off of I-75. It's also just off of um, Tamiami Trail, which is the local uh, uh, road that goes all the way, essentially, from Tampa to Miami. That's the name, Tamiami. Um, and so having that centralized location allows you to be easily accessible to lots of different people. Um, neighborhood. You can get much cheaper real estate in a worse neighborhood, but then you're in a bad neighborhood. So when we first started, we rented, uh, and it was in kind of on the outskirts of a not so great area of town, and we had to deal with things like homeless people coming into our building to use the bathroom. Someone actually came into the office at one point and said that he knew me and I had done an evaluation with him, and he wanted to know if he could borrow $60 for a drill. Okay, so I did not know this person. This was an uncomfortable interaction to deal with, but you're going to deal with those sorts of things in a worse area of town. However, if you're in a nicer area of town, it's much more expensive, but you don't have to consider those sorts of factors nearly as much. Uh, another thing is appearance and prestige. Uh, when I first, first moved to the area, I was working at a private school, uh, and I was also sort of moonlighting at a private practice where, you know, uh, she was great. I really liked her, but her office was like was not very nice on the outside. You know, the sign was was half lit up, and it was not in like a great area of town. So, like that sort of thing, you walk into that office and you just don't necessarily feel comfortable. You have to be, you might want to put some money into it so it looks a little bit better appearance-wise. Where we currently are, and we bought a building in a medical complex. And the benefit of that is that we have lots of medical professionals, as, as well as other types of you know, lawyers, engineers, think different types of people that could potentially refer to us. So it's really nice to have those referral sources right there. And not only just for your referrals, but also so you have other referral sources to give to your clients. Um, professional communities. It is so important that you guys join local organizations, state organizations, and national organizations. You really are giving back to the field, and it's a way for you to also get your name out there, meet a lot of people in the area, know what specialties are in your area. It's very helpful. Um, and lastly would be privacy. So there are lots of locations that are literally right on 41 or Tamiami Trail, but not everybody would necessarily want to be easily visible walking into a psychologist's office. So although it would be great exposure, a lot of people would also be put off by it because unfortunately in the medical community, we are a little bit of the redhead stepchild and nobody really cares to say, oh, that's my pediatrician over there. Hey, Dr. So-and-so, but it's not quite so comfortable to be in public and it's like, oh, there's my psychology. You know, so you have to be careful about those sorts of things and where you choose to set up your practice. And then overall size, um, you know, if you have desires to expand as a business, then you don't necessarily want to buy a two-office suite or rent a two-office suite because then you're going to have to move. So there's a lot of forethought and planning that's necessary to determine uh, what's the best building. You watch us switch. <laughs> no one does all the marketing ones, and I step in for all the boring technical <laughs> or exciting, depending on your personality. Uh, okay, so reimbursement. Uh, one question I have if you're going to start a private practice is whether or not you're going to take insurance, and if you're not going to take insurance, how are you going to get paid, uh, and what kind of clients you're going to attract based off of how you receive payment. So. Uh, there are other methods besides insurance. Sometimes there's third-party contractors that you can contract with that will also give you that will also pay services for different individuals. Um, but a lot of clientele on 
obviously have insurance and receive uh, mental health services through their insurance. So they're looking for providers who do accept insurance. So uh, the considerations for insurance is that you get a high number of volume to come into your practice because people are going to look within network just like if we have something going on, I'm going to first check who's in network, who can I see within that. Uh, it tends to be a little bit of a lower reimbursement rate unless you know how to negotiate with them to increase your reimbursement rate um, and that's usually with time served. So you don't get to walk in the door and say this is my rate, they're going to say hey this is the rate we're going to give you after you've been with us and now you have the pool to say I see this many of your clients, I think you do owe me more money. Uh, and it's been this long, then you can negotiate. But off the bat, you're usually accepting their standard rates of what they give for that area. Um, if you're dealing with insurance, or if you're having clients who want to be able to submit to their insurance out of network, then you do need to be knowledgeable of ICD, ICD codes. That's your diagnostic code. So um, even though we were using the DSM, those codes don't work anymore. Now you're on ICD-10, and that's what you need to know. Um, and then they update those all the time, so what you bought in your book is not the same, and so they send out new publications and say so you have to go check those numbers because someone will get kicked back if you didn't add that one, two, three, four, fifth number that they added. So those are all the little headaches of making sure all your numbers are correct. Um, CPT codes, that is every type of therapy or type of assessment has a billing code. And you need to be able to provide those billing codes, whether you're taking insurance or not, back to your clients so they can get reimbursed for the service that they have at whatever they've negotiated with their own insurance company. These are things like there's a separate billing code for each type of test that there is, psychological test that there is out there. There's billing codes for different types of therapy and different lengths of therapy. And knowing what those codes are for each thing is important. Um, they revised this, uh, what was it? Two, three years ago and there there's a new revision coming out so if anybody's keeping up with the APA um, practice organization they're doing a training on it I think coming up next week or so about the 26th um, so if people want to read that stuff they can generally it's based off of what Medicare puts out and then the insurance then informs their rates so you want to look at what Medicare is doing each year as well and that's where you see all this talk so even if you don't accept Medicare or you don't have a lot of Medicare clients Medicare is dictating what all the other insurance companies are doing um, and that's why you see everybody kind of watching that closely uh, and then there's a headache of insurance period uh, some insurances uh, have reputations of periodically dropping their rates completely um, we don't like them and don't do business with them <laughs> and then some you just have to submit and resubmit because they don't like one billing code and so you have to think is there another billing code that would still fit uh, for the service that I provided uh, if there's not then you are stuck holding the bag on that payment or negotiating with the client as to how that gets paid if you're an in-service provider uh, and or altering the code to make sure and making sure that that's consistent with the records that you're keeping so that the submission to insurance is accurate. So, if you build it, they won't just come. All right, it takes a lot to build a practice. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to touch on was building your niche. So, these are some of the questions you really need to ask yourself. What does this community have? For example, um, you know, when we first decided on Fort Myers, a big piece of that reason was we looked on Psychology Today, which is essentially if you Google, you know, psychologist Fort Myers, that's the first thing that's going to come up with a list of people. And we noticed there was only about a handful of people that saw children and adolescents. So clearly this community does not have very much in terms of service providers for that population. And also, what does the community need? A lot of times, uh, when we first moved to this community, uh, there was almost nobody doing autism assessments, at least not comprehensive ones. Well, nobody was doing the ADOS. And so we realized, oh wow, there's a big need there for people to do this, and that's one of our primary things that we're known for in our community is doing good autism evaluations. Um, another thing that we know in our community is there's very few people doing eating disorder work. 
So things like that, you find out, you're like, okay, there's a need here, so if you can find someone that can fill it, or you can fill it, then you're going to be starting on a good foot. Uh, another thing is joining professional organizations. As I mentioned before, this gets you a lot of exposure. Um, taking CEUs and documenting those CEUs, understanding what uh, additional training you can get to fill other needs in your community, um, and uh, providing training. So that's one of my favorite things to do is I give lots of presentations. I'm actually giving one next week to a very large private school on how to recognize and treat math learning disorders. So things like that, when you present on those sorts of things, you get people recognizing your name as being associated with that, which is obviously going to get you uh, referrals. Which brings me to the next uh, slide here, which is building referral sources. Um, collaborative care is a big piece of this. You're going to have to go out into the community. This is what I did for the first year of starting this business. Every time I had a free hour, I was going to a pediatrician or a psychiatrist or a hospital or a school. Anybody that I could get to meet with me, even if it was for 10 minutes, you're getting your name out there. Because a lot of times with referral sources, it's not necessarily that they're going to be able to say, oh, go to Dr. Katz for this, because they have professional guidelines as well, where they can't just say, go to this person. They have to give you a sheet with at least three people. But you might get people that are like, yeah, here's three. And uh, <clears throat> as I pass this to you. Um, or a lot of times what I find is that it's not necessarily that they even know that you're doing good work. It's just they recognize your name. And I've heard of that person before, so it's like when they say, hey, I've seen Dr. This, Dr. This, and Dr. Katz, they're like, oh, I saw a presentation from Dr. Katz, or he stopped by our practice, he seems like a nice guy, whatever, you know, they would say, that's going to get people to choose you over those other people. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, these clients is a big one, okay, and you can't really do much about this one, but word of mouth is a huge piece of getting referrals. We ask on our intake form that our reception staff do, you know, how did you hear about our practice? And we love to see ones that said, well, you know, my friend, her son or daughter came here or something like that. It's a really good referral source. Uh, volunteer community involvement. Shiva and I were on a uh, autism uh, committee that provided funding for local families to get services uh, for autism. Uh, just doing all types of volunteer organizations is really helpful. Um, internet marketing, as I mentioned, the only one really you want to do here, in my opinion, is Psychology Today, because it is the first hit on Google. It's only 30 bucks a month, so it really is worth it for you to do. Uh, and things that you can do to maintain referral sources are sending out you know, thank you cards or little gifts. At one point, we were before we had kids. Uh, we were particularly ambitious and we made pickles <laughs> and sent them to our referral sources, like homemade pickles. And that was great. We had to still have people who say, oh my god, I love those pickles that you guys made. <laughs> so like, people remember that sort of stuff. Um, and that's how you maintain referral sources, which is a big piece of it as well. So our practice now has um, six doctors including myself and Nolan, uh, and then we have three full-time support staff and um, a part-time um, staff member, as well as semester-to-semester -semester interns that come in. Um, and that is how we function. So there's, there's a few things that we really focus on in our practice. So we have two primary goals. Two primary goals, and one would be quality quality of the services that we're putting out there. So the, we've gone around it a few times. So one is evidence-based and research-based. When we have practitioners that come um, and submit uh, their resumes and their applications for us, it's really important that we see work products at that interview stage and see different types of work products so that we understand what type of quality work they produce. Our name is on the letterhead of every report that they put out. It's important that they put out quality work products. Uh, and then for a period of six months to a year after that, we uh, have ongoing supervision or consultation for them. Um, obviously, if it's a resident, it's at least a year or until they get licensed. 
uh, if they're already licensed, do we still require about six months where they're able to consult with either myself or Nolan or another doctor in the practice that we pay to stipend for them to be able to supervise them? Uh, and their reports are all being reviewed by that person. And that person is not just like giving them extra work to do, but kind of saying like these are some really good recommendations that our referral sources expect to see when these are the diagnosis so that they can get them the right type of services. If you don't put them in, then they don't get authorized. Um, so this is a, it's an important way to understand how, the, how our particular area functions. Um, Additionally, we have ongoing supervision. I have paid for doctors who want additional specializations to receive supervision from somebody that has that specialization so they can expand their area of practice. Um, I think it's important. So if you're kind of like, oh, I really want to do this type of evaluation, I don't really know, but well, let's, let's get you trained. Let's, let's send you CEUs. Let's look them up. Let's find you those. Let's get you somebody who knows how to do it. They can monitor you. They can review some of the stuff that you're putting out before it goes out. Um, and we do all that to ensure that we have appropriate services. The other thing we've done really to help with um, quality is we don't use an answering service. Uh, we have, there's a machine when we don't have office hours, but when we have office hours, staff is picking up the phone, unless they're right then talking to somebody else on the phone or in person. Uh, and that's why we have the staffing that we do. But that allows us to not only um, to receive intakes appropriately, but to refer people to appropriate resources. There's times when we're not the appropriate fit for them, and the staff knows where they should be referred to. So we do ask, you know, sometimes people confuse psychologists with psychiatrists. And so they're calling, they're thinking that they're scheduling an appointment with somebody to have medication. We're very clear to say, are you looking for medication? If they say yes, are you looking it for it from this visit? <laughs> uh, yes, but this isn't the right place to go. Here's a list of places that you should be going to. So making sure that they're appropriately getting fit in where they need to go and the staff knows about referring to those things. Uh, we have in-house billing services. So if there's questions about what happened with billing, how did that occur, they can be transferred right over to that person. That person's able to answer their questions and able to talk with them about what happened with insurance, how it was followed up, and when it needs to, where it needs to go from there. Um, we have procedural manuals for how the practice runs. Every receptionist is trained on how they respond to different situations to ensure that they're not passing out information inappropriately, that they're responding correctly to the questions that are being posed to them, and if it's not listed there, then they get back to them with that answer. Uh, the other big thing that we've been able to do that really helps the quality of our support is that we had, have had and continue to have internship opportunities for both undergrads and grads. And what we were really thinking, and I've seen this done before, is that psychologists produce these big, long reports. So we have like 10, a minimum of 8 to 25 pages, 50 pages, depending on the types of evaluations that you're doing. And you want those proofread. It's best for us to be hiring somebody who actually wants to read that stuff. <laughs> and so that's what we brought in interns. Um, to allow them to do the proofreading, but they're also getting great exposure to what types of reports are done, what types of evaluations are out there. Um, and so that's one of the things that we do for our interns at, at different levels. Um, and then we do have them involved in uh, data entry. So the complex tables that the doctors create that have all their scores and things like that in them, anybody can do data entry. But there's some people who are more interested in doing it, it happens to be people in our field. And then they're getting to see, like, oh, okay, that's the percentile that goes with that standard score. And they understand that they're actually better catching errors than somebody who's just dumb entering the numbers um, because they've had stats classes and they have some assemblance of what some of those scores mean. Um, so they're not interpreting it, but they are able to do the data entry of those. And I think that really helps us to put out better quality because we're putting people into slots, and we know that from interest stuff, of doing things that they're interested in. And when people are interested, they do a better job for you.
So if you could be here around nine, that would be great. Okay. Oh, oh, and I almost forgot. Um, I'm also going to need you to go ahead and come in on Sunday, too, okay? We uh, lost some people this week, and uh, we need to sort of catch up. Thanks.
and I did a lot of ADHD research. That was really my focus. I had a counseling focus. I knew from the get-go I wanted to be in private practice. I struggled through stats and methods because I had to, but it was not my thing. I knew I wasn't going to be a researcher. Um, and when I, I ended up doing my um, internship out in California, and during that time, I would come home from uh, my day at, at, the, at the internship, and I would look into, okay, building a business, what is this gonna take? And I started to look into business plans and getting answers, and I would just use my time to do that. Um, and then when I moved to, uh, back, I moved up, I'm from the DC area originally, so I moved back there, and I started my, um, what did I, I started my postdoc under a private practitioner because I knew that's, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I, um, is this the right order? I feel like I'm missing the E-triple-P in there somewhere. Um, do you guys know what the E-triple-P is? Okay. <laughs> I don't think I knew, <laughs> but it's your national licensing exam. So you also have to find some time in your life to study for that. So, um, I, I, oh, you're right, I did do that after. So the first time I did my post, when I was doing my postdoc in DC, um, the private practitioner that I worked for helped me to understand it a little bit better. Um, but then when I actually studied and became licensed and I needed to get hours for my postdoc, she didn't have all the hours to give me. Um, and, and so I said, okay, well, I kind of have to start my business. I just have to get out there and do this and find my own clients. Um, so, so I did. And I grew it from there, and I stayed in the um, D.C. area for, let's see, what were we, five years? Um, so um, my husband's here, that's who I'm living in. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I also was, we were starting a family. So we had to balance the um, having kids and building a business and how do you do all this? Um, and it's tricky. And um, I'll talk to you more about the details of, of the, the locations, um, which is really important too, because I established my practice up in the DC metropolitan area where there's a psychologist on every corner and it was a completely saturated market. So my market plan up there had to be very different to then we, uh, in 2014, moved down to Florida and we are in a community called Nocatee, which is a very up and coming Nocatee outside of Jacksonville. And it's an entirely different market. So my two business plans in those two different places were very, very different. Uh, so let me just get into that. Am I doing it right? <laughs> oh, am I doing it the wrong one? No. Oh, it did? Or should I see the air? No, not that either. Oh, there's a something. there. I'll start that over for the video. So going back to the, the Holling Code, I, I've always been some version of an SA. And I like to think that my S and my A make me a good therapist in the room with my clients, but my E is what drives me in being a good business person. So I think that it's, it's important in private practice to have those entrepreneurial skills because you are always putting out fires, you are always moving from different things. So to be able to enjoy that is going to be really important. 
uh, strong executive skills, which I'll talk about, and obviously my work has been a lot in ADHD, so we, I work a lot with that. Um, willingness to take risks. I'm a big Angela Duckworth fan uh, on her research on grit, and I think it's very important when it comes to being a successful business person. A strong social support network, I'll talk about. Uh, product and market knowledge, like I talked about, I've lived in different locations now and have seen uh, how different it can be in different geographic areas. Adaptability, flexibility, obviously belief in oneself is very important. Um, and to be a Goldilocks achiever, and I think this is this is important to mention because I know I'm in a room full of overachievers and perfectionists, but in the real world, you have to just strive for that Goldilocks level. You're not always going to be perfect. You have to get to the point where you're good enough and be okay with that. So the great Char uh, Charles Charles Gordon, Russell Barkley. <laughs> <laughs> I should know this, I've said this a hundred times. Um, the great Russell Barclays uh, defined executive functions as those actions we perform to ourselves and direct at ourselves so as to accomplish self-control, goal-directed behavior, and the maximization of future outcomes. This is a constant process in the world of business. Um, as, as Nolan and Chico were mentioning, you're constantly refining your product, your model, you are having to uh, figure things out as new technology arises. So you have to be very flexible, you have to be constantly analyzing your behavior. Uh, simple things like call people back. You know, I mean, how, how many times have you called for a service, left a message, and no one ever gets back to you? So part of being successful in business is those, those very, very basic principles. Um, we, we are a little diff uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about my business model, but and I don't have, I don't pay someone to answer my phones 24 seven or even during normal work hours. Um, uh, my office manager is a contractor, so she returns the calls when she can. But what we found, uh, found over, over the years is that the people who are very serious about receiving services, they'll leave a message. So that's almost like our first form of weeding out people because when you pick up the phone, sometimes you'll get someone who wants a two hour free therapy session and they take up your entire afternoon. So we choose not to do that. Um, and then she returns the call, our, our message says, we will get back to you within 24 business hours and we always do that. We are always following up and just making sure that you know customer comes first kind of thing. So these are our executive functions that you all probably know well, but they all come into play. Um, especially as you, uh, I have a, a, a pseudo, I call it a pseudo group practice. And so it's a little different model than, than Shiba and Nolan, but it's not a solo practice. But so as I, um, I do have a lot of other people to manage I also like to do things like presentations in the community and, and things like that. So, so working memory and recall is imperative. Um, I still use a pay, paper planner, the same kind I used in grad school to keep track of my time management and stay organized. Um, controlling emotions is very important because you do need to tolerate a lot of frustration in the business. Uh, so, so all these things that we think about um, when it comes to executive function also make for a good and successful business person. And then back to grit, as I mentioned. Um, so, so grit is, is essentially resiliency. It's the ability to, to face failure, experience failure, and to learn from that failure, learn fast, move forward, and make progress. And if you're familiar with Angela Duckworth's uh, research on grit, that she's found that it is a better predictor of success than things like IQ or talent or money or all those other things we think of when we think of successful individuals. So the ability to fail and fail fast and, and learn and just go on is imperative. You're not, every decision you make is not going to be the right decision, but you have to move on from it and keep going. So back to the, um, the personal story. 
And uh, so he, he, the pros and cons, right, and all these things when it comes to private practice. And these are just things you have to think about. And I'll be honest, as a woman, you have to think about different things as a man. Um, you, you, if you're going to have kids, you have to carry those kids. If you want to nurse those kids, you've got to nurse those kids. Um, so uh, the nice thing is that you make your own schedule. Uh, you get to decide when you go to work. You don't have to be there certain hours. If you need to take off, you take off. So the scheduling is really great. Um, I, my husband and I have have to navigate this all the time. He has, it sort of has to work a job that is a full-time job with benefits um, because we know that that provides stability for our family. And when we were starting, we started as if we were on a, a one-income household and we were living on his income. And because we knew I wouldn't have kids and I wouldn't be able to build my practice really quickly. Um, so, so mine was just kind of the bonus as we built. Um, and we made decisions based on that. You, you don't want to make a decision based on a projected income that you don't know if you'll get to and buy a house that you're not going to be able to afford. So all these things come into account. Um, the scheduling, like I said, the pros, you get to schedule yourself. One of the cons, or I mean, it could be a con, but you have to think about this, is if you are seeing anybody except maybe retired people, you're going to have to work evenings or weekends. So if you're seeing kids, they want to come after school, uh, unless maybe for testing, they, they'll come in the morning, but that's a, that's a one-off. But if they're coming weekly for therapy, they don't want to miss school. If it's an adult and they work a job, they need to come in the evening. So I'm at my office oftentimes till 8 o'clock, 8 or 9 at night. But the trade-off is that um, in the morning, I see my kids off to school. I will often go and uh, work while my kids are at school, now they're school age, so that's great. And then I come home, when they come home from school, I'm with them for an hour or so, so they get to see mom, and then I go back into the office, and dad takes over, and then I'm there till eight or nine at night. So you have to logistically think about all this stuff too. Um, as I mentioned, health insurance and, and benefits, um, I don't get any, you know, I'm, I'm self-employed. So my husband has the job that has the health insurance and we use that. So you have to think about that as well. And then financial risk. If you are going to, for example, buy your office, you're taking out a second mortgage on another building. Um, you are, if you get, you need to take maternity leave. Or for example, I just recently, um, was uh, ran for a school board in my community. And to campaign, it took a lot of time away from my business. And our revenue went way down, but I knew it was an important thing to do. So, but during that time, you know, we had to account for that, that we weren't gonna have the same income for those months that I was doing that. Um, back, to my, back to my story of the different locations. And I'll work that into the business plan. So let's let's go back to when I was in California and doing my internship and trying to figure out the business model and how I was going to do private practice. First thing I did was I googled how to write a business plan, and these are just some of the basic things that you're going to want to address. There is an organization called Score.org, and it's an online organization that's still around. I made sure. And it's been around for years. And I had a free, uh, they provide free business mentors. So it's people around the country in various uh, fields of expertise who volunteer their time. And I had an online relationship with this woman who would just help me uh, I'd feel any question that I had about anything. And it was really great. Thinking about the company description, one of the first things I had to think about was what, is, what am I going to call myself? And, uh, you know, Nolan and Sheba did their, use their last name. You hear a lot of people do last name counseling. Um, I, I was thinking about ADHD. I was thinking about how can I draw in um, adolescence, maybe? How can I be a little more friendly and 
and not as clinical looking, so I thought about my name. The first name that we came up with was Psych Ed Coaches, and that, that applies to what I'm gonna tell you about the first half of my business. Um, and then later on, we became Psych Ed Connections, so I have a, it's called a DBA, Doing Business As Name. I thought about the logo. You know, what is your logo gonna look like? And uh, again, I wanted something a little bit fun, something that might, in, might draw a younger crowd. And um, it'll be on one of my slides, but uh, <laughs> we settled on kind of a swooshy thing. I wanted to really, it's kind of like our version of the yin yang. So it's, it's the, the, the intertwined uh, psychological and educational pieces. So you gotta think about that for colors, you know, all these things that we don't even, we don't talk about. Um, so, products and or services. Well, when I first started the practice, like at coaches, I was moving back to DC, as I said. DC is a very saturated population. And I said, well, how can I stand out? Um, I knew I wanted to be in that area because that's where I grew up. And I said, well, the way I can stand out is with my ADHD expertise. So, we decided to start a practice solely focused on ADHD coaching. And <clears throat> that helped us to grow uh, in the beginning when you know, everyone's offering multi, you know, uh, all sorts of services, we, we were a niche service. Operations and management, um, again, going back to uh, like office management and your phones, I answered my own phones up until probably a year or two ago, I was a, it was the last thing I really wanted to give up because as Nolan said, you're selling this and no one is going to sell your business as well as you, no one's gonna care about your business as much as you do. And I tried, uh, when, I, when I couldn't afford to pay very much, I tried paying someone not very much, but you get what you pay for. <laughs> and I, you know, I saw that we were losing clients. And so I took the phones back over for a while, and now I'm finally at a point where I can, I can pay someone their worth and have somebody who can really speak to, because you'll get, you'll get people asking all sorts of questions. Um, so the person who's answering your phones, it's not like calling the dentist and scheduling a cleaning. You know, they're calling and they're saying, I don't know what I need, this is what's going on, and so that person who's answering your phones really needs to understand the ins and outs. Um, again, the, the marketing and sales plans, I think one of the best things was just cold calling, knocking doors. I joined boards, I did presentations, I, you know, like Nolan, would visit every office in the area trying to get known. Um, I also, at the beginning when I knew I couldn't put in a lot of time with clients because I was raising my, with, with my babies, I, uh, ended up writing a book, and um, what had happened was Dr. Pervat was getting on my case for publishing my dissertation, and she was saying, when are you going to publish? And I really didn't want to, so I said, well, how about I turn it into a book instead? And she was like, okay. So I, I did, I, I turned it into a book, and again, needed to be very gritty through that process. I lost, I, I put it out there to several people who, who said no thank you. Um, but finally, the APA became interested and we published our, our first book. Um, we've, we've done two now. And that has really, really helped too because now I'm the person who wrote that book. So I will get sought after because of that. So any way you can make yourself unique and stand out in any sort of field of expertise is certainly going to help. Having a financial plan, I kind of already mentioned, you just need to make sure, especially if you're you know, in a marriage and a family, that everybody's on the same page and understands the risks that it's going to take um, on your end to make this happen. So when I, um, this is us now, uh, you see over here, that's the book we, we wrote, uh, the first book, Succeeding with Adult ADHD, and the second book, ADHD Coaching, which is a guide for mental health professionals. So in DC, we had this niche market. What I ended up doing was having, 
because it's a very large, sprawling geographic area, I ended up having one or two people in various offices, and we would just rent space. This wasn't a big operation, we didn't buy a space at this point, but we would just rent a space in somebody else's office, so I might have one person in Alexandria, Virginia, two people in Ashburn, Virginia, Centerville, or in, even at Maryland, and all around the DC area. And we were the, the ADHD coaching organization. When I moved to Nocatee, where we are now, it's a new community. It has, it is still being built. It had very little services, very little, every, anything, retail, everything. There was a public when we got there. And an opportunity arose for a building, an office building, and I said, we gotta get in on this. So I purchased a unit in this office building. I made the decision to use two of the offices, and then the other four offices there, I rented out. So I had a speech therapist, I had a massage guy, I had a CPA, so you just rented those buildings to cover the mortgage. And then what I've done over the last couple of years is as we've filled our clients and grown our practice, they, I've kindly asked them to leave, but they knew that coming in. <laughs> so now we fill the whole space. I have 10 therapists on my staff uh, and growing. Mine are all 1099. So what that means is that I, I can't tell them exactly what to do, but they still need to do a great job to keep their job, kind of like a contractor. And um, they, but they set their hours. So it's, I have you know moms who have kids and want to be home for this and that. So most of my staff work maybe two nights a week and maybe a little bit during the day. So there's a lot of flexibility. We have a, a monthly staff meeting where we all sit together and we go over cases or troubleshoot anything that's going on in the practice. We do a wide range of services. So since I knew, okay, I'm going from a community that's oversaturated with services, I need to be niche. And now I'm moving to a community that does not have services. I want to get as much as I can. So we do assessment, we do play therapy, we do groups. We do tutoring. I have, uh, at any point in time, about five or six tutors that, that work with students that need tutoring in the community. And we've even started to do in-home tutoring, which is nice because you don't need the office space for that. So at any given time, they could be anywhere within our community tutoring. Um, I've become a business partner with all the local schools, which is really helpful. When you become a business partner with schools, you get to go to their events and put up a table and talk to people. Um, I've been invited to do speaking events because of that. So that's a really important thing to do. Um, just being out in the community and being seen. It costs money though. You have to spend money to make money. So each business partnership can cost you $1,000 a year. Um, but, but it can pay off in the end too because we have a very good reputation within our community. I do a lot of volunteer and philanthropic stuff so that people also see us um, see us out there doing that kind of thing. This is um, an example of one of the things we do out in the community. It's called Family Bonding Night. And we've gone into the schools and we have an evening where families can come in and we play basically those trust building exercises that you might play at a workshop retreat or something. And the families have so much fun. And so they really get a, a good taste of, and we talk about communication and, and, and you know good parenting tips and that kind of thing. And then I also do a, a race. Um, this will be our third year, this Thanksgiving, doing a Thanksgiving day, 5K and 10K. We do it in our community. We get business sponsors, and we have a kids fun run, and we do a golf cart parade after. Um, so, yeah, the sky is the limit, and that's the really, really cool part about it, is, you know, you came in here to be a therapist, and in private practice, you get to be, wear so many hats and be beyond that. So, really, I'm just always, that's the E coming out, I'm always coming up with, like, new fun ideas to make our practice grow, to make us seem strong, um, and, and fun, and, and just represented above the community. 
On the downside, I do run into my clients in public because I live where I work. Um, you do have to think about that. I, I see clients in my bathing suit at the splash park sometimes, but it's a trade-off um, because I also, also now, I know these families and they know me. Um, you know, my kids go to school with their kids. So there's also, there's also a very uh, good thing about that as well. So uh, I, think, I think that's all I got. So <laughs> again, thank you. Please feel free when we, when we come up. Um, and, I, and I hope I saved some stuff for Mary Catherine because I know this is going to get a little repetitive. But thanks a lot. But 
I knew I didn't want to work in an organizational setting at that time. I was ready to have some independence and some flexibility. And so I told myself, if I fail, then in six months, I will pick up a different job and I'll make other arrangements and other plans. Um, so one benefit I had as a postdoc was there was um, a clinician who had her master's and she, her name was Allison Curier, and she offered um, a group in building a private practice. And so over five months, we met five different times. So there was a group of six of us. Other postdocs that I completed in Georgia with also decided that she wanted to open a private practice. And so through those five sessions, it was a wonderful opportunity. It gave me a lot more confidence in kind of moving to Georgia and starting the private practice. And that's kind of what um, led me to make it. So how wise is it for the average counselor to begin his or her own private practice? So as you kind of think about your own stories and your own journeys, does anyone want to share what might be a potential risk or fear in starting their own private practice? This economy. Okay, good. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep, not having benefits, that's a great point too. Um, I was blessed, it kind of, I knew that starting the prior practice within about three months of getting the practice started, I would get, I would be married. And my husband did have benefits, and so that was definitely a factor that kind of allowed me the opportunity in that moment to kind of start um, on my own. What about rewards or benefits to starting your own practice? Flexibility. Yep, flexibility, time. I heard autonomy back there too. Um, and then the last thing, I always like to ask in my presentations, what do y'all want to learn today? I want to make sure that y'all, if you have a question or if there's something that you really want to find out that's important to you that I cover it before my time is up. Yes? I'd say what was your biggest challenge? Okay, great question. I'll definitely um, hit on that throughout the presentation. So a couple of risks that came to my mind was risk of failure. What if this doesn't work out? What if I can't do it? What if there's not enough clients? Um, loneliness, so being in a counseling center program, being in a pre-doc, being a post-doc, you're constantly around other people. There's opportunities for consultation, for feedback, for supervision. Going into a solo private practice, you may or may not come in contact with anyone else other than your clients in a, in a whole week. Um, reduced consultation opportunities, Sometimes that might lead to errors or missing things that might be important. And then also burnout. It's nice that you have independence and it's nice that you have the flexibility, but you're also your own boss. And with people who like to be perfectionistic, who like to help people, sometimes it can lead to working longer hours than you probably should. Um, rewards, obviously independence, autonomy. At Georgia, there was a cap in how many sessions you could see people. Sometimes that was frustrating because you knew that if they could just get another two or three sessions, they probably would be where they needed to be to maintain. But because of that strict cap limit, you didn't always get to do the work that you wanted to do with that person. Um, flexibility throughout my different practicums. Each site had different requirements of what they um, wanted. Some paperwork would take me 30 minutes to kind of check all the little boxes that they wanted me to check. So it was nice to kind of say, this is what I find to be important to note and kind of stick with it. Um, an increased income, um, not feeling the pressure to change my style as a counselor to fit the style of a supervisor. So when I was doing my internship, I was one of very few that was not psychodynamic and psychoanalytic. And so in my cases, when I was doing my pre-doc, I almost had to change myself in order to pass and graduate so that they were kind of, I felt the pressure to kind of become a different person than who I was. And then also variety. Like it has been mentioned, you can do individual, you can do group, you can do couples counseling, you can do assessments. There's just so many options out there and so much variety that was also kind of a, a positive for myself. Um, so in my group practice, or in my kind of group, um, the abundance kind of builders, I guess what I would call it, where we had the five sessions to kind of um, learn how to create a private practice. In our first kind of group meeting, she asked us to write down all the fears that we had. 
and I fell on that sheet of paper, and my initial fears were, I'm too young, I don't have enough experience, I'm gonna fail, I won't have enough income to pay bills, no one will pay me if I don't take insurance, um, there's already enough clinicians, they don't need another one in the state that I'm going to. I'm good, thank you. Um, and so in that group, we learned to kind of affirm ourselves. So to think more of an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity. There are enough clients out there. I have what it takes. Trust my skills, trust my education, that type of thing. And I think that's really important when you go into private practice to remember that it's okay to have fears. Those fears can motivate you. Those fears can guide you in the right direction. Um, but if you keep listening to those fears, you may feel stuck. So just to kind of remember that in your mind too. Um, specialization and niche. So like others have mentioned, it's really important. I kind of think about like the, the job search process. So if you have too big of a job search, it may be very difficult and very overwhelming. Um, and so if you kind of specialize, it takes away some of that pressure and you can get really good at the clients that you're seeing. And so in Macon, there was no eating disorder clinician within almost a 65 mile radius. Uh, people were being referred to Atlanta and Athens, and that was really hard for people who gas and time, and if you're meeting with someone weekly, that was just really difficult. And so that became one of my biggest populations in Macon. And although I don't take insurance, and I'll explain that in a little bit, because there was no clinician within a 60 mile radius, those clients actually received in-network benefits because they weren't penalized for not having that on their insurance. And so that was another big blessing for me when I was in Georgia. Um, the community demand. Macon didn't have as much technology savvy in their community. If you were to go Google psychology today, there might be six clinicians that show up. So by just showing my face on the website, I, I think I pulled in a lot of people. Um, and I also have a young face. And the majority of people in Macon seem to be a little bit more middle age, and so it, again, worked at my benefit um, when I was living in Georgia. Um, sometimes when you list out all these specializations, you kind of lose yourself in that process, and so I again, kind of repeat and reiterate, it's good to have your niches. Um, and then same thing, craft your website to match your ideal client. So thinking about what keeps your client up at night, what would you find in their journal if you were to read it? What would be their three goals for coming to counseling? Really match your website, because that's one of their first impressions they get to have of you. And if, if they're reading that, trying to find the right fit, then they're going to really appreciate that if they can find a bond or connection with them. So in terms of therapy office, um, it's really important to have good parking, good lights, something kind of warm and welcoming, sound barriers, especially if you're in a place that might be if you're in a practice that has um, multiple offices and multiple people coming in and out. Um, as I transitioned to South Carolina, I um, decided to just go ahead and get a refrigerator and have snacks because that was one thing I didn't have in Georgia, so that was a learning lesson for me. Um, I found that sometimes just having something to drink kind of calmed down the nerves of clients. Um, and in this generation, people always bring their cell phones and get really panicked if their cell phone is dying or if they you know need it for something else and so just having a charger seems to have been very helpful for some of my clients as well. Um, first impressions, that's the first chance your client gets to, to meet with you. And I don't have an office manager or an office assistant. And so for me it's really important that my phone and my voicemail system match the type of person that I want to present as. And it's also the first opportunity for them to kind of get to know a little bit more about myself. Um, also included in your voicemail, making sure there are emergency instructions. Sometimes you will get clients in emergency and in crisis. And from an ethical perspective, it's important to make sure that voicemail includes contact information from an emergency kind of perspective. Um, also important, sometimes it's easy to be like, oh, I'm going on vacation. I'll be back next week, but then if a new client calls and then they don't hear from you in a week, that's not a very good impression that you want to leave. And so making sure you update emails, update voicemails so that you're getting an automatic reply and not making someone think, bless you, not making someone think that
that you're not, you know, motivated to get back to them, not taking clients, that type of thing. Um, I myself hold myself to a standard of um, within 24 hours, I will respond to all emails and phone calls. Um, I used to have one phone, and I used an app called um, Verizon One Talk, so it allowed me to have two numbers, but with one phone. I now just have two different phones, one business, one personal. That way, if I want to leave and not take my business phone with me, I can leave it at home. I can still check it, but it's not taking work with me everywhere I go. Um, and then lastly, Reiner Counseling um, for the website. I have found it's nice to use gifts of other people. I am not very technological savvy, and so I have someone that manages my website for me if I want to update a blog entry or if I want to you know, add information about myself, change pictures out. I just pay for the service and they do it for me. Um, and I'll give you that website name. For me, it, it's worth every penny and every cent of it. Um, and that's also a great way for clients to get to know you better um, and get a, an overview of what forms they might expect when they come to counseling you can kind of give them directions. So again, having good ways for them to kind of have that first good initial impression. A lot of times people worry that they're not going to make enough money to be successful in private practice or what if there's not, again, enough clients. When I was at Georgia, and I'll just be honest, like my, my postdoc salary was $24,000 a year. And each week I saw 32 clients, ran two groups, had three hours of supervision, and also had to do um, outreach. That was a lot of work for not that much of a financial kind of income gain. And I remember going into that abundance um, practice group, and she had said, think about what your ideal you might charge, and then just see what happens. Just having five clients a week um, per month would be more than a postdoc only seeing five people. That's a big difference in seeing 32 people doing two groups, doing outreach, managing supervision. And so it kind of, again, gave the confidence that it's not impossible. Um, private practice is definitely a feasible option. Um, if you Google it, most psychologists typically see between 25 to 27 is typically a full caseload. And so you can see that the income rises as you see more clients. Um, so, business costs and tools. Costs, expenses, plus payments paid. Um, again, I didn't go to school to be an accountant. I didn't go to school to be a business owner. And so I had to really familiar myself, familiarize myself with um, accounting kind of information and legal information so that I knew that I was setting myself up to be in the best place possible. Um, my first year, I didn't do a great job of knowing, whoa, I can write off furniture. Or, oh, my cell phone plan, that can be written off too. And so each year, I've gained more knowledge and more information um, about how to set myself up to be in the best business um, setting as possible. Um, in South Carolina, I have chosen to rent instead of buy. Down the road, I might um, buy something, but when I was in Georgia, I knew that it wasn't a forever home. And so for me in that place, the market was not great. And I didn't want to have to deal with the hassle of selling a business or selling a, a property. I decided to rent again in South Carolina because I wanted to make sure that I liked the area that I was in rather than committing um, to a space. And the total monthly expenses of that really weren't that outrageous. I'm sure in Florida, the prices may be a little bit higher than making Georgia, um, or even Greenville, but for me it hasn't been um, a huge cost or a huge expense. LLC versus S-Corp, um, it's great to get more information about that. I was an LLC tax my first year, and then I have switched, moved to being, continuing to be an LLC, but being taxed as an S-Corp, which sounds complicated, but um, that's one thing that you would want to consider if you were to start a private practice, which tax bracket or which tax um, corporation would be best kind of fit for your need. And then obviously maintaining your malpractice insurance. My favorite tools while being a private practice is Simple Practice, which is basically a client data management system that maintains all appointments people can schedule online. It keeps their client contact information. I do all their notes. 
through a simple practice. Um, it takes credit card payments, so I don't have to worry about that. And Rider Vision is the website company that manages um, my site for me. It's like 60 bucks a month, worth every penny. Simple practice is maybe $50 a month. We've already mentioned Psychology Day. That's the only other place that I um, advertise my services. And again, that's $30 a month. So again, low cost for kind of what you might need to start a practice. And then Verizon One Talk. Um, like I said, I did it for the first year, year and a half. And then I decided that I'd rather just have the two different phones. Insurance rumors to accept, to not accept. I think there's a lot of personal choice that kind of goes into that. Just being in a solo practice, it makes it really challenging to take insurance um, because there's not anyone filing for me. There's not anyone calling insurance for me. So I had kind of calculated in my mind, if I take insurance, I'm probably going to have to take a whole day off of work of seeing clients. And to me, um, I figured there's other options that might be a better fit for me. And like I said, when I started and then when I moved, I told myself that if I wasn't full within six months, insurance was always an option. But I will say, if you start on insurance panels, it's a lot harder to get off than to get on. And so I didn't want to have to deal with that headache either. Um, you've heard a little about insurance reimbursements. They're not all created equal. They can change their plans pretty quickly without telling you. Um, sometimes they require pre authorization, sometimes they don't. Sometimes if the codes differ, they'll get denied. Um, Sometimes they have a set session, so they may say, okay, we'll give you eight sessions, but they don't tell the client that, and so when they submit their, their paperwork for session 12 and they get denied, there's frustration over that. Sometimes they want a, a different code to, die, to reimburse, and for me it just wasn't a very comfortable thing, and I'd rather just say, what can we do to kind of make this work, or what referrals can I match you with, rather than um, taking insurance at this point. Instead, I've tried to think of other ways to meet, to meet the needs of my clients. So there's a site called Open Path Collective, Therapy Within Reach. And I am a participant of this. Um, I typically take three on at a time. And those sessions are maybe $25 or $30. Um, and so it's a way for me to kind of still charge my regular, regular rate without feeling like I'm not also meeting the needs of clients who may not be in the best financial situation to um, participate and engage in therapy. For college students, I maintain a sliding fee scale. I realize that they are kind of in a different um, situation, graduate students too. And so that's one way I kind of meet the needs of um, younger professionals. And then in Macon, I also did some pro bono work. I've done less of that in Regal. The, the population has changed. Regal is a little bit more um, affluent and there hasn't seemed to be as much of a need um, for doing pro bono work. But Open Path is a great resource, and I encourage people to kind of think about that. They are also in a financial situation that might um, require them not to have the funds to engage in therapy. Networking, when I went out to Georgia, um, I committed every day for 60 days to meet someone new, whether it was um, a physician, if it was a dentist, if it was a teacher, if it was a dean of Mercer, just anyone that I could kind of tell my story to and try to connect with. Um, I think I made it to maybe day 32 before I really kind of ran out of time to kind of make that into my schedule. Um, during holiday season, sometimes I'll get popcorn baskets or um, sometimes like little cups of candy and just put my business card on the cup or on the popcorn tin and just distribute to potential referral sources um, and opportunities to kind of connect with others in the area. I've also sponsored some events. Um, I'm a big tennis player, so when we were in Georgia, I, I helped sponsor all the different tennis tournaments. And that was just kind of a fun way to help what I'm also passionate about while also getting my name out there. Um, since being in Greenville, I've sponsored two CrossFit events. And again, it's fun to see your name on a shirt, but it's also nice to help other things that you're passionate about. Um, offering educational presentations to physicians and doctors. Dentists um, are one of the first line of defense for people who struggle with bulimia, and oftentimes they don't really recognize that they have a, a pretty critical role in spotting that um, within their patients. 
Same thing with OBGYNs, with trauma work, and so just kind of offering your services, A, to connect, but also help educate others in the area. Um, other disciplines, nutritionists, the divorce attorneys, um, bariatric surgeons, again, college administrators, and then athletic directors. You know, again, people who are working with my niche um, will help me in my practice. So those are some of the people that I've been able to collaborate with over the last three years. Research. So Florida State, I was very much a research guru. I loved it. Um, it was a break from studying from academics. And when I um, started in Georgia, I was like, great, I'll teach and do research, and this will be fantastic, and I'll still kind of get to carry that. Um, I learned that in private practice, again, you have so much autonomy and so much flexibility, you also have to be careful to stretch your time too thin. Um, you can do so much, but you also have to kind of think about what is realistic. And so I did research my first year, year and a half, and as I kind of transitioned, it's been a little bit more difficult for me to maintain that, but it is possible if you are interested and, pa and passionate about um, continuing that research. Um, there's always research needs within hospitals, within colleges, um, even within our personal private practice. To see your clients' progress over time, and all the John Hopkins, they use a program called Celeste Health PHM, Behavioral Health Monitoring. It's a 20 item question, and it's really great for detecting suicidal ideation. So I still use that in my practice, and it's nice because it shows the progression of their mental health um, and their lifestyle choices. And so that's how I continue to track data individually um, at the practice level. Self-care is really important in private practice because, no, again, no one's telling you to go home at night. Um, one thing that's really helpful is consultation groups. I meet with a group um, once every three weeks on a Friday to talk about cases, to talk about what's challenging, to just kind of get support and see what other people are doing in the area. Um, connecting with others and other collaborators, caseload considerations. So again, what is realistic? What is um, appropriate for that individual may differ. So we haven't had children in the past, so I haven't really had to consider the child care option. I am pregnant now, and so that will be a new consideration to kind of um, think about moving forward. Um, I'm a big advocate of rituals when I leave, so I spray my office with lavender. If I have a really tough day, I'll practice like literally like shaking off the egg of the day. And so when I leave, I'm not just taking you all home with me. Um, thinking about your different hats and your roles, so it's easy to be in psychologist hat 24/7, but you're also typically a friend, a wife, or partner. Um, and so making sure I'm not psychologist to my husband all the time. Sometimes he gets very tired of that. So I've had to really work on making sure that when I leave the office, again, I'm back to, back to non-psychologist role. Um, always sleep, nutrition, exercise. Those are back to the basics, just like you hear in graduate school. Even though you're studying, even though you have multiple demands, multiple hats, I can't advocate enough for making sure you're having enough um, rest, good um, nutrition and exercise. And then for me, I've always taken at least a half a day off, usually on a Wednesday, um, or a full day off, depending on um, what kind of is going on in that week, just so I'm making sure that I'm kind of maintaining that self-care for myself. And lessons learned, it was mentioned as well, this path is not linear. You know, you wish it could just be straight, but there's a lot of curves and turns, um, and that's okay. It's also important to be open to opportunities. So when I moved to Greenville, um, there's an eating, eating disorder recovery center. So my niche in Georgia became not a niche in Greenville. I'm hoping that over time, I will build that back up, but I knew that that was gonna be hard in the beginning. So I've been doing more ADHD learning disorder evaluations for, um, there's four colleges within like a 15 mile radius of my practice, which is great for me. Um, I've done a couple of bariatric evaluations as well. Um, there's a program called Logistics Health, and I do one-time evaluations for veterans, and that's been really valuable in Greenville. I've done three different expert cases and eyewitness cases. So again, just being open to opportunities. I write for the local newspaper um, every two weeks. So again, just kind of being mindful. 
really the sky is the limit. You just have to choose what is kind of what you're, you're passionate about and kind of go from there. Um, negotiating office space. Some people just charge a flat fee, whether it's $600. Some people say, give me $10 for every client that you see. So you kind of have to choose which, um, how you want to kind of make the most investment into your practice. Client load is something to negotiate. Um, I'm not in a group practice, but sometimes if you're in a group practice, then you may have to give 35% or 40% of what you make to the person who is in charge of the group practice. They can probably speak more to that than I can, but that's kind of what I've heard in the past, and that's one reason why I chose to kind of be in solo practice. Um, in Georgia, what did it include? I had access to a copier, a fax machine, um, paper, or just anything I ever wanted. And in my office in Greenville, none of that's really included, which is okay, but it's good to know that up front so that you're prepared. Okay, I need to make sure that I have a good printer and scanner um, at my disposal. Setting fees and policies, again, we love to help people, and sometimes we can get, if we set ourselves up, we can get taken advantage of, so it's really important to be very clear in the beginning. If you don't let me know within 48 hours, I'm going to have to charge a no-show fee. And that can be difficult when you know that there also, there's a reason why they maybe couldn't come. But again, you have to also be your business owner, because it is a business. Just like if you probably had an appointment with a the doctor, they probably would charge you copay because you didn't give them enough notice. Um, you will make mistakes. I think in Georgia, maybe my third month, I overbooked, I double booked myself, and that was embarrassing and terrible, but at the same time, it was a learning lesson and reminded me to slow down. Um, you'll be tested. You're never fully ready for private practice, but then you're okay. And then there's all these other benefits that kind of come with it. Um, and don't panic. My motto, again, was six months was kind of my time mark, and it's kind of like pregnancy. Give yourself six or nine months to transition, and then make a decision. Is this a good fit for me? Is this not a good fit for me? And this is just a basic checklist. If you wanted to start your private practice, what you um, what you need to do in order to kind of, um, make sure that that would happen. So. I know I talked fast, I was just trying to get to the panel without anyone being late <laughs> to their next uh, Friday commitment. So thank you. So I know everyone is probably hungry and needing a potty break and uh, you know stretch break, but uh, if you do need to head out at 11.30 when we're technically supposed to be ending, feel free to do that, but the pizza is on its way, so we're going to chat for just a little bit longer past 11.30, and I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to have their questions answered. Uh, before we get that started with that, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Lindsay Jenkins. I'm one of the newer faculty members within the program. Uh, and just as an FYI, the department name is Educational Psychology and Learning Systems, and our program name is Psychological and Counseling Services, and then there's programs within that. So that is the current state of our department name is Educational Psychology and Learning Systems, one of several different uh, program areas within the department. Okay, so at this time I would just like to open it up to any questions that you all might have for our panelists, and we'll try to get through as many of those questions as we can. Not all at once. Yeah. <laughs> yes? So what do you do for sick days, especially unexpected or sudden sick days? <laughs> um, I, most of mine have to do with kids. Uh, when you have kids, then you're usually the ones getting sick. Uh, I find that most people are pretty understanding. Sometimes you might need to uh, pay it back a little bit, so then if they have a situation where something happens and they can't cancel within your 24-hour cancellation policy, I'll kind of give a grace um, if I've asked something of them. Uh, Um, so one other thing is just that you want to make sure um, that if they are you know okay with that sort of thing that if the next week maybe stay an hour later 
So you know I don't have availability for three weeks, but because you know you're understanding, I'll stay. I'll say too, like just like I asked them to give me a 48-hour notice. If I don't get that return. I usually will say the next session is on me. I apologize for you know, not that you apologize for being sick, but if they've taken time off work or if they made other arrangements, then I can't on them. I try to make it equal. Great. Next question. Yes. In the beginning, it was, you know, stressful. I've done this for two years. Probably 70% of my clients I'm making were eating disorder clients. And right now, I'm probably at 10 or 15%. Um, but I knew I also had other interest areas. And so there's not many people in Greenville who have a lot of pain and OCD. And so in some ways, I try to reframe it as I've done a lot of work these last two years. And sometimes those cases can be really complex. And so training cats and being able to kind of soak in a different, in a different population in a way was kind of a nice opportunity. So I just tried to kind of reframe it and remind myself that, again, rather than like that scarcity mindset, knowing that there's an abundance of some population or some ability to kind of meet those needs. Good question, though. Yes. Um, it's, I have a question for Cassie. Um, so you guys hire um, people to work under you, and you said you kind of do personality hiring in a way where you kind of see if they're fit. What kind of personalities would you look for? Like, what works best? Like, what are you kind of, what are you looking for in someone who you think will be successful? Okay, uh, one, we're not, we're not doing enough of the eyes on them. We want to. We want to look at it, but. Uh, what we what we're typically doing is we have um, a standard interview that Nolan and I will conduct, but then we allow the doctors to come that same day. Um, almost all of them are present on the same day of the interview. We'll do a lunch together, so our interview process is pretty lengthy, um, and then they have time to meet with the doctors afterwards and kind of ask their questions about how the practices run, um, how our personalities fit. It's more casual that way, which also lets the doctors kind of feel like, okay, we, we chatted about this, we chatted about food, we chatted about these kinds of things, like they fit with this community or their interests of what they want to be, um, connect with wanting to be in the, being at our practice. Um, you know, mostly that we're, we're screening that we're not inviting in somebody who would be a poor fit, as in like our doctors, um, very open with each other. They talk on a regular basis. They consult with each other. They respect each other's um, diagnosis and skill. Um, and we're looking for people that kind of come with that same open mindset um, into the practice that they're looking for people that they can collaborate with uh, and they feel like um, they can connect with and refer to. And you know, we're not we're not there to we're there to build each other up and not break each other down. Uh, yes, my question is also for the Cassies. Um, I also understand that you guys are involved in family law as well. Um, what are some things that you did to better prepare yourself for that legal aspect of going into that? Uh, she that does more of those cases, so I'll let her talk about some more technical things. But one of the things we've both done is join those professional communities. I learned, I was the president of the Association of Family Law Professionals. Attorneys, judges, mental health providers, and actually financial forensic investigators. Um, and that just taught me an amazing amount about so many aspects of that system that I had no idea about because we just focused on the mental health aspect. So that was tremendously helpful for me. Uh, the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts does have student memberships, and there's a Florida chapter. Uh, right now, I'm on their board. Um, and it was a chair for their this year's uh, conference. So that's a great training opportunity, and they have national, it's international 
uh, conferences as well as ones at the state level. Uh, the big thing for that is knowing the limits. So the, the guidelines for dual roles are very specific um, and familiarizing yourself with the legal issues regarding that for to practice as well as the ethical issues. ASPC also publishes ethical guidelines on all the different types of work um, that are pretty thick but worth reading if you're interested in that type of work. Um, practicums in that as well are helpful. So if you have practitioners in this area that are looking to supervise um, you in that area is a good time to get into that. That's how I actually got into it. Uh, and then after that, it's then picking up uh, internship, postdoc, or uh, additional supervised hours as you're getting into that field. I just wanted to hit on one, one quick point about that too, is that you have to keep in mind forensic work, it definitely pays really well. Um, but you're dealing with people who are both, gen if we're talking about divorce cases, like both very litigious, so you have to be so careful about, like she was saying, your role and how you conduct yourself and be extremely clear in your initial documentation and things like that, that it is one of those specialties that you really need a lot of extra experience before I would, you know, actually step into doing it. Anything else? Mine was really based on my research that I was already doing here with Dr. Pratt, and my dissertation was on ADHD coaching for college students, so it was really just an extension of that. Um, it made it pretty easy for me. Uh, on the flip side, I will say sometimes now in, in, in my more general practice, I, I enjoy seeing other cases, but I've almost... Uh, um, what am I trying to say? Like, like, put myself in this box of, of I'm the ADHD expert. So sometimes people think that's all I do. So then I have to convince them, no, 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 I can do that stuff too. So you have to just be uh, mindful of that when you are choosing an area to specialize in. And for me, I, I've always been interested in eating disorders. And so when I applied for my internship and my postdoc, I wanted to find a program that had like a mind body. Um, concentration and focus and then through that experience I learned there's so many connections between eating disorders and trauma they go hand in hand similarly there's a lot of overlap between eating disorders and OCD so my first niche kind of transformed into okay these three other categories are pretty similar to um, self-harm which will be a fourth one that kind of goes into that but um, blood out I knew that growing on my college um, Jory had a lot of people who struggled, and so it kind of opened my eyes to the need. And similarly to Macon and Spartanburg, people had to, had to drive 30 or 40 minutes to get to a treatment center. There was no even residential place in the state of South Carolina at the time that I was in college for my roommates, my friends, to kind of go to treatment. So that's what sparked the initial interest, and then making sure I kind of found um, programs that allowed me to kind of gain more specialization. For me, I think I specialized in learning certain types of therapy um, that treated multiple types of disorders. And I think part of what we see as you watch the DSM change, as you look at differential diagnosis, but also um, very rare for people to walk in and only have one disorder. And so you can say like, oh, I specialize in anxiety disorders, but how many people with anxiety disorders also have depression or also have OCD or also, so it, it, it's a nice idea to say I'm only going to see people with this one disorder, um, but unfortunately that's not people. Um, and they come with other things. So like some people come in, and I have a few doctors that are comfortable seeing people with trauma, and so we try to make sure that those types of cases don't end up on their schedule. Um, but sometimes they do, because there's a lot of people with mental illness that have a history of trauma. Um, so I think it's been me that's expanded my specializations because then I'm seeing people and I'm going, I need more on this, so I'm going to go train on this now. Um, and that's what needs to happen. So that's, that's how I've expanded the different areas. I 
think one of the things that's easy to think about in, in this profession is what type of system you want to specialize in. Uh, for me, it actually became more about what role I wanted to play. So I am a licensed school psychologist. I got into this field wanting to be a school psychologist and work in the schools. I did not initially think I was going to go into private practice. So after you know, I graduated and I did residency in a school, but came to realize in private practice and through what me and Shima wanted, uh, I realized that I still needed to have some school. So what I have now specialized in and become very known in my community for and take on additional volunteer roles with is actually being an advocate. So when I do an evaluation, I just don't express the results to the parents or, or the you know, adult, but I will actually go to the schools and be a part of the IEP meeting part of a 504 meeting, I go to the schools and consult with teachers because I had a professional need that I was not fulfilling in private practice and I wanted to make sure I could do that and also I could get paid for doing that. And so my specialty was more about my role than it was necessarily a specific diagnosis. Yes, I was wondering what you would consider to be the most valuable tasks that you engage in intrinsic value, I, I think that the most valuable thing that you get out of this, and I think it's the reason we, why we all come into this, is when you have those moments with your clients where you see the progress, you see the effect of what you're doing and how valuable it is. I don't think that there's anything that really beats that. Um, it just, it's why, why you keep going. Um, I'm working on extrinsic. Anyone? Yeah, extrinsic. Yeah. Money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my extrinsic is efficiency, so I love that word and say it all the time, but I like to follow something all the way through and watch it flow through the practice, um, and so that ends up being keeping the communication flow from the staff who are really assessing what the community needs are able to tell me the types of referrals that are coming in and um, what people are, are needing uh, and what they're seeking. Uh, and then all the way flow down to the doctors, what does the doctor can lead back up. And so running that course back and forth um, I think really helps. Uh, then the other thing that I really, um, that I think is most important, um, and intrinsic and extrinsic actually are very blurred lines for me because it turns out the thing that I really enjoy also bring external rewards on their own. Uh, but that is being able to uh, keep up to date. So when I started into this field, I didn't know if I wanted to go into research or if I wanted to go into practice. And I kept going back and forth. And I used to always say, what if there was this thing where uh, somebody could translate the research into practice? Uh, and that like doesn't exist as a job, but I try to always think about that. Uh, so when I see, I read the research about like monitoring suicide risk, then I update my forms that the doctors are using. We do an in-house training on that so that as we know things research-wise, it doesn't take us 10 to 20 years before it shows up in practice. I don't need to do that. I can do it now. And that was something that really um, accelerated my interest in building my own. Um, and I think that's what also keeps our doctors with us because they know that I do that and they know if they see something that they're like, hey, I just read this research article about this. We don't we don't ask about that on our intake forms when we add them, like, it's on there this week. Like, I'll put it on there. We'll upload new forms and that's <laughs> up to date. So why not be doing that? Whereas if you answer to something that creates your forms for you, you might know you gotta be monitoring something and you're having to type it in each week and remember to do it. Why why doesn't your form do that? Because your form's not created by the practitioner. And so that was something I really wanted. I wanted to be instantly able to implement what is happening in research and what is happening in practice. 
Uh, extrinsic, like Gabby was saying, it's hard for me to think of something as tangible as it is financially beneficial to be in private practice and we live a comfortable life at this point, which is very important to me. Um, intrinsically, I consider myself my favorite job in the world is being a father. And in private practice, you do get that ability to shape your schedule. So I love the fact that I can come home and go swimming with my kids or play a game with them, or if I want to go to the gym, I can go to the gym. You know, you, you have that flexibility in scheduling and knowing that I can put my favorite job as a priority through that scheduling piece, uh, you know, being a dad. My parents were very supportive in that way. There was always at my football and cross games and all, all those events, and I wanted to be that dad. So uh, that really affords me that ability. Interesting question. I mean, I think for me, intrinsic similarly is seeing clients progress. It's not a shame someone said, you know, teach a man a fish for a day, teach a man a fish for a lifetime. Like, I get the intrinsic satisfaction when I see them making leaps and bounds and not needing me anymore. Um, extrinsically, my biggest love language is words of affirmation. So, it is nice to get feedback, or, you know, I still get calls from Georgia. Um, can you work with this person? And so, obviously, I made an impact. I mean, it's nice to hear, so I guess that's probably the extra thing. Like, you know, people write a review, you may not ask for those reviews, but it's, it's still nice to, to have that. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, oh, there's three hands, oh no. I'll let you find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I So every two years, you have to make sure the CEUs match what that state wants, and then you also have to pay um, the licensure fee for each state. Um, but because I don't have an office in Georgia, I don't have to pay um, like the, the Ryan Counseling business fee like I did when I was in Macon. So if I had an office in both locations, I'd pay both licensure fees and then also both business fees. But just having one location, so that just seemed that be. <laughs> But it's not bad, it's, but it's well worth it. Yeah. yeah, so when you're when you're becoming licensed, just some of you may not know this, it, you know, the, the EEEE is a national exam, and then each state has its own requirements. So I'm licensed also in Virginia and in Florida. And in Virginia, it was a take-home test, and they gave me a packet of information, and I get to fill it out and send it in. In Florida, it was a lot of information that you have to memorize and you have to go to a testing center, take that at the testing center, and then pass it. And then, in addition, every state has different CEU requirements, which can get very complicated because in Virginia, I renew annually, and I have to have 13 a year. In Florida, it's every three years, two. And we have different requirements in terms of, um, you know, every five years you have to do domestic violence and this and that. So you're keeping track of both. There's um, a website called CE Broker. Is that the website, right? CEBroker.com, which I really recommend getting on if you're going to be licensed because they keep track of all that for you for however many states you want to, and it makes it a lot easier. Well, hopefully our panels might be taking questions even after we officially end. So let's give them another round. And I've also heard there are alumni from all over the country. So if you are alumni of this program, would you please stand up? So let our current students know who they can go talk to. Look at all these alumni. to go talk to those alumni, come talk to our panelists and our speakers, and just, you know, get this information. These might be future mentors for you, and mentorship is extremely important for you as you go through your professional development process, and um, reaching out, and I probably all of you have mentors that have been there for you and have, you can ask questions about, so it's something that you really should, you know, spend your lunch break also mingling and getting some more information about those who have 
has paved some paths before you. And I just want to thank you so much for being here. We're having pizza because it's the 60th anniversary of our pro of our department or program program, but it's also the 60th anniversary of Pizza Hut. Oh. That's how we ended up with pizza. And so enjoy the pizza and please stay and ask as many questions as you can. Thanks so much for being here.